A uh, very good evening to everybody joining us from South Asia. A uh, very good afternoon to everybody joining from Europe, and a very good morning to everybody joining us from North America and South America. My name is Dipankar Basu. I'm associate professor in the Department of Economics at UMass Amherst. On behalf of the co-organizer, my friend and colleague Debarshi Das, associate professor in the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences at IIT Guwahati. I would like to welcome you all for this event. Today we are gathered here to uh, release a festive for Amit Bhaduri and to celebrate and uh, celebrate the contributions of Amit Bhaduri to heterodox economics. The book that we are releasing today grew out of a conference that Debarshi and I co-organized in March 2019 at the Department of Economics in UMass Amherst. Amit Bhaduri obtained his bachelor's degree from Calcutta in 1960 and from Cambridge in 1963. He finished his PhD in economics from the University of Cambridge in 1967. Over the years Amit has taught at various universities across the world including in India, Europe and Latin America. But his association has been longest with the Center of Economic Studies and Planning in the Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi. He taught in JNU from 1973 to 2001 with a short gap in between. After 2001 Amit was emeritus professor in JNU and then in January 2020 he resigned from his emeritus professor status in protest against the vice chancellor of JNU Amit's contribution to heterodox economics is are too numerous to list but if we are to identify some key sub areas where amit has made lasting contributions then there are at least three one is heterodox macroeconomics in which the bhaduri marglin investment function and wage led and profit led growth has become a workhorse in heterodox macroeconomics his contributions in political economy of agrarian change in the late 60s and early 70s was also something which led to lot of subsequent research his contributions to classical political economy and neo ricardian economics which we, he had engaged in during his phd was also a very fruitful area of research the book that we are releasing today reflects this breadth of amit's contribution to heterodox economics i hope you will engage with its content at leisure Today we are fortunate to have three leading economists to talk about this book and about Amit's contributions to economics in general. The first speaker will be Robert Blecker, professor of economics at American University. The second speaker will be Moshumi Das, professor of economics at the Institute of Economic Growth in New Delhi, India. And the third speaker will be Anjan Mukherjee, professor emeritus in JNU. New Delhi India With that I would like to briefly mention how we are going to organize our meeting today so after I finish we will have the three speakers talk about the book about Amit's contribution each speaker will roughly speak for 15 minutes after that we will hand it over to Amit Bhaduri to make comments that he wants to make After that we will open up for questions and comments from contributors from participants and what i would like to suggest is that if you want to speak you just write your name or you just say i want to speak in the chat box and i will maintain a list once we come to that list we will go down the list as we have depending on how much time we have we will allocate time to each speaker and at the end debarshi das will make a note of thanks so with that i would also like to just mention that if you are not speaking please keep your microphone <coughs> muted that will be uh, useful for people hearing the the person who is speaking 
So with that, I would now like to turn it over to Robert Blecker for his comments on the book and Amit's contributions. Robert. Well, thank you and good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. It's great to see so many familiar faces and fellow fans of, of Amit. Uh, and I want to say what a great honor it is for me to participate in this event. I want to thank Deepankar and Debarshi for inviting me to lead off this conversation. And this is a truly humbling experience uh, for me. Uh, second, I would like to salute them, uh, the two editors for the publication of this enormously useful and comprehensive volume. Uh, this is not only something that honors Amit, but it covers uh, most of the areas of economics and political economy that Zipankar referred to, which Amit has emphasized in his career. Now, I just received an electronic copy of the book recently, so I, I have only begun to delve into its chapters, uh, but each of the ones I've read has been a gem and uh, time constraints certainly prevent me from talking about any chapter in any detail, but I find it to be a rich assembly of articles by some of the finest minds in political economy today. And I commend it to everyone uh, to read it cover to cover when you have the chance. And I'm especially pleased, this is more of a personal note, to see that two of my former Stanford classmates who I think are here today, uh, Peter Sai Wing Ho, and Tracy Mott of the University of Denver, but we all studied together at Stanford, uh, have chapters in the book. Uh, fittingly, all the chapters I've looked at break new ground in numerous areas, and they're at the cutting edge of contemporary discussions in both economic theory and economic policy. The essays in this book will bear reading and rereading for many years to come. But I want to devote most of my time today to expressing my admiration and appreciation uh, for the work of Amit Baduri and his influence on my own career and my own work and that of so many colleagues around the world. I first read some of Amit's work uh, in graduate school at Stanford where I was studying under Donald Harris in the early 1980s. And uh, I met Amit in person when he visited Stanford and worked with Don in the mid 1980s. Unfortunately for me, timing wasn't the best. Uh, I left Stanford in 1985 to take up my position at AU uh, in Washington shortly after he arrived, uh, after Amit arrived. Uh, but I know he had a great influence on other graduate students there in addition to Peter, for example, also my colleague now at American University Maria Floro, also known as Sergi Floro, has told me that uh, Amit was uh, very helpful to her when she was working on her doctoral dissertation. Now, I stayed at Stanford just long enough to connect with Amit and to see him present an early version of his work with Steve Marglin in a seminar. Uh, it was a truly captivating and inspiring uh, moment for me because I was working on related areas in my dissertation. I also attended a seminar on Amit's joint paper with Don Harris on the complex dynamics of the simple Ricardian system, which was published in the QJE in 1987. But I have to confess that as I was writing this 36 years later, I could not recall which of them presented the paper. I, I remember the, the paper, <laughs> but it was either Don or Amit or both of you. I, I, I really can't remember who, who, who gave the actual presentation. Anyway, I then met Amit uh, at the, again at the Trieste Summer School in 1987, where he lectured on a revised version of the baduri marglin model, as we now call it. And he counseled me about my own efforts to publish my dissertation research in what became my 1989 Cambridge Journal article on uh, growth and distribution in an open economy. At that time, I was very concerned about the potential overlap between what I was writing and what Amit and Steve were doing in their famous model. But Amit was very positive and encouraging to me. He advised me that if I focused on the open economy dimension and properly cited their work, there would not be any problem. And that advice benefited me greatly in the early stages of my own career. 
Now, I could not have imagined then, 34 years ago, how influential the Baduri Marglin model would become in the subsequent literature in post-Keynesian or heterodox macroeconomics. Not to mention how much of my own career for decades has been occupied with related concerns. But as we look back, I think it's important to remember how subtle and nuanced their original analysis was, which has sometimes been forgotten in later discussions. Of course, their work was most famous for demonstrating the possibility of profit-led demand, or what they called exhilarationism, uh, in a, a closed economy. Even in a demand-driven system, depending on the parameters in the saving and investment functions. Whereas earlier neo and models had only allowed for what we now call the wage-led case or stagnationism. But Amit and Steve also recognized from the beginning that there was not a simple bifurcation, <coughs> excuse me, into wage-led and profit-led demand regimes. On the contrary, they showed how distributional shifts could have divergent impacts on key variables, such as the rate of capacity utilization, the profit rate, the rate of accumulation or growth rate, and the level of employment. <laughs> Excuse me. These distinctions led them to identify what they called cooperative and conflictual, or some say conflictive, cases of both stagnationism and exhilarationism which have often been overlooked in more recent theoretical discussions and empirical estimates. Moreover, uh, for the authors, this was not simply an intellectual exercise. Their objective was to illuminate the political economy of macro and distributional policies uh, at the time. Remember, they were writing around the first decade of what we now call the neoliberal era and the class dynamics underpinning alternative political strategies. Since 1990, when their two articles were published, the literature building on the baduri marglin model has become truly voluminous. This literature has branched out in numerous directions, including endogenizing income distribution, linking to conflicting claims models of inflation, further open economy extensions, including models with balance of payments constraints, building in financial sectors and analyzing financialization, connecting demand regimes to labor markets, technical change and labor productivity, uh, neo-Goodwinian models of business cycles, structuralist models for developing countries, and much, much more. And of course, Amit has contributed to these extensions uh, especially on the financial and the policy side. Oh, I even forgot to mention monetary and fiscal policy, which have been additional uh, uh, extensions. Meanwhile, empirical estimates of demand regimes have mushroomed in the past two decades, especially the last 10 years. Although to this day, they still find puzzling conflicts in their results, which have been the source of continuing controversies. And I'm actually working on a project along those lines uh, as we speak. Now, most recently, Amit published a paper in the Review of Political Economy just at the end of uh, last year, in which he applies his theoretical approach in analyzing the future direction of capitalist democracies and the prospects for social democratic policies. In this article, Amit links the demand regime to the behavior of the social wage. He starts by considering how the social wage would have to adjust, rise or fall, to maintain a given rate of capacity utilization in response to a rise of the profit share, where this relationship varies according to whether demand is wage-led or profit-led. This analysis shows, among other things, that the conservative argument for a lower social wage rests on assuming a, de a profit-led demand regime. Amit in this paper also addresses fiscal policy, highlighting the potentially negative impact of a budget surplus and endogenous responses of the social wage to changes in income distribution, among other questions. He concludes, and I quote, suitable variation in the level of investment in the social wage 
through sustained fiscal policies can bring about a regime change. Not surprisingly, budgetary measures affecting the social wage are a fiercely fought ideological territory, end of quote. And that is certainly a very apt observation today. We are about to see it play out in real time uh, as uh, President Biden and Vice President Harris uh, submit their economic plans to Congress. And I'm sure in India and, and countries around the world, the same kinds of debates are occurring. Now, I cited this most recent paper of Amit in some detail, not only because of the important issues it considers, but also to show that he fully retains both the intellectual acuity and the political engagement that have characterized him throughout his career. I last saw Amit in person uh, at a conference in Berlin in October 2018, where we both delivered introductory lectures. And I look forward to seeing him again in person as soon as possible after we all get vaccines and get past this pandemic. Thank you very much. I look Thank forward you, to seeing a lot of the rest of you too. <laughs> Thank you, Robert. We will now have uh, Moshmi Das, Professor of Economics at the Institute of Economic Growth in New Delhi. Um, okay, it's truly, uh, thank you, Deepankar and Devoshi. It's truly an honor and a privilege uh, to be associated with this book release event in honor of Professor Amit Bhaduri. And, uh, you know, thank you for giving me this opportunity to uh, express my deep indebtedness and profound admiration for Professor Bhaduri and his work. So, uh, um, you know, before I go to the, you know, uh, you know bit of a discussion about the book, um, as much I've read, I've been able to read it. Uh, I just wanted to say that uh, my, so, I mean, you know, the first time I, you know, I came across Professor Bhaduri's work was again, uh, you know, during my undergrad days in Presidency College. Uh, and much like, uh, as Professor Amitabha Krishna Dutta has mentioned in his article in this particular volume, uh, I was taught uh, his article on uh, agricultural backwardness and semi-feudalism in the undergrad that course. And the teacher uh, was, you know, didn't fail to mention that Professor Bhaduri was a student of the same institution with great pride. He mentioned that he was also a student of Presidency College. And then he also mentioned that, you know, he was a, a founding faculty at, you know, at the Jahalal Nehru University. But unfortunately, when I joined uh, JNU in early 1990s, uh, Professor Bhaduri wasn't there. He was then in Europe. Uh, so, but to my great, you know, excitement, uh, you know, when I was, after completing my MA, when I was doing my PhD, he came back to the center. And so I remembered that even though I was not formally his student, I didn't take any of the formal, you know, classes, attended a formal or took an exam with him. Uh, I remember that all of them, my entire cohort doing PhD in JNU at that time would sit and attend his uh, macro courses that were offered for the MS students. And it was, uh, I still remember that um, for all of us, including the uh, current students, uh, it was a great, uh, you know, matter of great uh, discussion and argument uh, to decide uh, who was the best teacher in CSP at that point of time, the three contenders, the three stars being, and all three of them are present here, I can see, where Professor Bhaduri, Professor Anjan Mukherjee, and Professor uh, Prabhat Patnaik. You know, much like, much like uh, the, the, you know, the three stars of Hindi film industry in the, in the 1950s, uh, Dilip Kumar, Devananda, and Raj Kapoor. So we had this, they had their own fan clubs, and we used to have heated argument about who is the best. And, and at the cost of disappointing Professor Patnaik and Professor Mukherjee, I must confess that, you know, it was Professor Bhadri was always the winner of this, you know, in the majority vote will always go to Professor Bhadri. So having said that, uh, I, I, I also want to say that after attending those uh, lectures by Professor Bhaduri, uh, those deep insights that I gained from his lectures, I carried them uh, with me when I myself joined the teaching profession in Delhi School of Economics. Delhi School of Economics then, as it is now, was the leaning was more towards mainstream than heterodox. But I think coming from JNU uh, with some perspective about heterodox economics, that, that gave me a unique vantage point to look at both the streams and trying to look for its similarities rather than you know, differences. 
and to some extent my evaluation of the book or my comments about the book today are based on uh, the 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 sort of similarities which i'm going to explain in a moment between the two streams even though uh, that's a sort of you know that's an unusual take on heterodox and mainstream economics but i think you know that's uh, to some extent i think there are great similarities and this book also uh, can point direct towards that so having said that its volume uh this uh, you know i i haven't again i received the one much like others i received the one pretty late so i haven't been able to go through all the essays but i have gone through the first few essays uh, and the part one of the book which uh, all of them deal with growth and distribution and they deal with in particular uh, almost all of them are talking about distribution it's linked to demand or distribution and power and the relationship between power conflict and distribution and you know so first of all the first thing that i noticed across all these seven articles that are part of this first part of this volume is how topical the book is in some sense as i was reading them i was you know reflecting upon the rising inequality not only in india definitely in india but across the world i was thinking about the conflict not necessarily probably the classical you know class conflict but class conflict reshaping itself in terms of conflict across religion conflicts cultural conflicts conflicts in you know in terms of race and you know ethnicity so i couldn't help wondering how you know how topical and how one can actually take this insights back to the real world which as we are as it's unfolding before us today so that probably to me was as was in some sense the greatest contribution of this volume in the sense that it gives us a, a handle to analyze the problems around us at least the first seven articles are telling giving me deep insights about how i'm going to analyze what is happening around us today and that's true about everybody whether he or she is coming from mainstream or from heterodox background Uh, it also talks about the first some of those uh, articles also talk about uh, the problem of demand and again sitting in india today i think you know we cannot uh, cannot help noticing how relevant those articles are uh, especially before the co even before uh, the covid crisis the indian economy there was a lot of discussion about how aggregate demand has become a huge problem so again i think this volume many articles from this volume gives you the precisely the tool to analyze those problem and come to a, a sort of a logical conclusion about which direction the economy should take having said that uh, i was sort of you know as i said i was going through those articles in the volume and given my uh, sort of familiarity with both the heterodox school as well as the mainstream school now having uh, taught a little bit of you know mainstream economics in delhi school Uh, i would like to point also and you know something which is probably a bit unusual which is that uh, no matter what uh, you know which perspective you are coming from you cannot if you are familiar with today's mainstream um, mainstream uh, macroeconomics or mainstream development growth and development economics you can't help noticing how fast it is approaching towards you know in terms of its view towards heterodox school so when i pick up my the articles from mainstream i find inequality there i find distribution there i find demand problems there so in some sense therefore i was reflecting on that and i was reflecting about what exactly is the similarity and the difference and to my mind i realized that uh, the the one of the highlighted differences between the mainstream and the heterodox approach where the mainstream is basing its uh, its uh, analysis more on optimizing agent whereas the heterodox uh, believe more on behavioral uh, relationship i felt as i was analyzing uh, those through the lens of these articles in this volume as well as the mainstream literature it appeared to me that you know that is probably that difference that dichotomy is probably a bit exaggerated in the sense that uh, there is nothing in optimizing behavior which will not generate by suitably tweaking the assumption which will not generate let's say a constant savings ratio and so on i think the more fundamental difference was is coming or usually comes from the fact that a part of the mainstream lit literature uh, all talks about believes in market fundamentalism although although even even that sort of uh, that approach towards looking in at uh, economic coming from mainstream background uh, increasingly uh, becoming uh, becoming more and more 
uh, sort of rare. So people, I think in, even in mainstream, increasingly people are realizing that markets inherently are imperfect. In the market, you have to take into account power distribution, you have to take into account politics. So political economy and power distribution and income inequality, these are fast becoming part of mainstream approach, not necessarily neoclassical, but certainly mainstream. And, and that is where I, I feel that the contribution of this volume to my mind is in some sense, you know, towards bridging this gap between these two schools. To my mind, this is probably the first time I'm seeing sort of convergence at least part of the mainstream literature with the heterodox literature, not necessarily in terms of the tools that they use, but in terms of the way they want to look at the uh, society and the economy and the way they think, which are, you know, what are the things that are important in the society and the economy. And to my mind, that's exactly where the importance of this volume come in. Uh, as I was sifting through the volume, I felt that these are going to be extremely important uh, uh, important uh, articles which not just the heterodox economics people but the mainstream people who are interested in these issues should look at and I think the greatest contribution of this volume or many articles of this volume is in terms of bridging that gap that gap is to my mind is already narrowing and I think this volume does a great job in terms of bringing the two uh, streams closer together more probably uh, you know than what the editors had realized. So they are really, this is basically, I think to my mind, this is probably a great opportunity for all the mainstream economics, uh, economists, not necessarily market fundamentalists to read up this volume and think about solving the problem, which are, uh, uh, you know, which are bothering all of us in this deeply divided society. It's bothering the heterodox school as, as much as it's bothering the mainstream non-neoclassical school. So to my mind, uh, that's exactly where the you know, contribution of the, this volume lies. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, Moshumidi. Uh, I would now like to turn over to Professor Anjar Mukherjee, Emeritus Professor in Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi. Professor Mukherjee. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, friends, uh, we have gathered today to launch conflict, demand, and economic development, and dissipate Omid Bhaduri. Uh, I must thank Deepankar and Devarshi for allowing me into this select group. Now being the last speaker has some problems because you've decided on some points, right? And I was aghast that most of them have been touched upon. Uh, uh, so I am reconstructing my talk as I go along. So uh, let me share with you my experience of having worked with Omid Bhaduri for a long time. I think. In this group, I probably know him the longest time because the first time I met him, as I was telling the others the other day, was 62 perhaps. When uh, he came back, I was an undergraduate and he had just finished his tripos and he came back to Presidency College to teach for a brief period. And there were friends of mine who were doing economics I wasn't doing economics, who came and told me about this young person who had joined, who had done so brilliantly in Cambridge. So I was just curious. You see, I had come to study in Calcutta from a small town in elsewhere, Patna in Bihar. So I had no idea of Cambridge was. And someone doing so well in Cambridge. So I went and attended a lecture. And if I recollect, this was 62 perhaps. I think he drew some boxes. Uh, and then there was uh, a person in the class who made an ass of himself uh, by asking stupid questions. So it's the usual undergraduate class that 
And so next day I ran into Amit Bhaduri in the coffee house. And I was shocked because he seemed to have recognized my face. And he came and asked me, oh, were you all able to follow what I said? So I said, no. So he looked crestfallen. So I said, but I'm not a student of economics. I've just gone to watch the fun. So he said, what fun? So he was a bit irritated, if I recollect. But then I didn't attend anything else. But I used to see him very often thereafter. My next chance encounter that could have happened was probably 1967. Because the Indian Statistical Institute in Calcutta wanted to set up an economic research unit. And uh, Professor Dev Kumar Bosch, I don't know how many of you know, I mean, some of Omit uh, that would remember him, and Moshumi probably also would remember Dev Babu. He came and told me that. Omid Bhaduri is joining. Why don't you come and join us? So I was not doing anything at all, right? I mean, I was uh, uh, working at the Indian Institute of Management in Calcutta. And I was getting bored. So I thought of joining, but then that didn't work out. In 1973, I joined JNU. Right? And the only other person who was there was Krishna Bharadwaj. And one day, I saw Omid Bhaduri coming out of the history department. Now, this is uh, 73 April, May, around then. And I latched on to him because I badly needed someone to talk to. And I, the only other person I knew was Omit Bhaduri. So I said, Ki, look, you are coming here, joining the center. He said, no, I'm thinking of joining the history center. So I was aghast. What are you going to do with the history center? Come, we are supposed to be starting an economics department. So I ran to Krishna and I told Krishna, what is this, Omit Bhaduri joining the history center? So he said, I know, but Omit is being difficult. So he has something anyway. So I don't know what happened, but finally he joined us. There's a group of three. And then the center was announced, I think, from July. And then I think somewhat later, Professor Pravat Patnaik, Utsa Patnaik, and Sunanda Sen joined, right? So the first admissions, the three of us did together. So the first batch of JNU MA economics, which had all kinds of people. Uh, Incidentally, the first time the center was located at the bottom of the School of Languages. And the students had a lovely story, which uh, I must share with you. They said that, that the reason was that we also taught Greek. That is why the center was located at the bottom of the School of Languages. But then, you see, that was the, when the exciting things happened. You see, almost every other day, Omit would walk in with a huge sheaf of these green-colored sheets. I mean, those of you who are working in North America, you have your yellow pads. We had our green sheets. They're slightly larger than your yellow pads, but they had, uh, um, as you write, and still writes, I suppose, big block letters, a very few lines, but they're big and strolling across the page. 
And by the way, all the papers that were being written at that time, that was very exciting. I got to read. I was learning a lot of economics. So my education properly began then. And these are most of the papers that appeared in the volume called Unconventional Economic Essays later on. But they appeared in journals before that, of course. And uh, Devarshi and Deepankar talk about them in the volume the introduction. Now, regarding Amit Badri, all of you have spoken about how he has chosen problems which are of interest. And they are different from what the usual set of problems that are studied. So emphasis should also be placed on the manner of his presenting his arguments, always within the context of well-defined models. In fact, very early on, I can share with you my recollections of a conversation we had with June Robinson. Joan Robinson was at the center in fact, staying with Professor Bhaduri, I think. And one evening, I'd been almost in the morning, I'd been blown away by Joan Robinson because of a discussion that we had. Someone introduced me to her by saying that this is our resident Walrasian. And immediately, of course, there was uh, all kinds of problems. But in the evening, she was much uh, mellowed, of course. And uh, she was advising me, and I think at Amit Bhaduri's house, about what should be done, what kind of problems to study. This is not about the tools of analysis. It was about the problems that you studied. What concerns you? She said it was all right to consider an equilibrium or uniqueness or something like that. They might give you something if you are trying to analyze something in particular. Omit was one of those who chose topics which were different from the rest of us. I would have said that he is better than any one of us, not different. And here I had a difference of opinion with uh, most of my colleagues, all of my colleagues, because I think they claimed, except Omit, I think, I think they claimed that we were different. In fact, our students also claimed we were different. And I kept on saying, for heaven's sake, say that we are better. I am willing to go with you and say that we are better. Don't say we are different. As soon as you say we are different, then you get into all kinds of trouble. But anyway, although he did not say so or support me in this uh, sort of uh, difference of opinion, but I think this is what he also thought. Uh, people haven't talked about his contributions to capital theory. They've talked about his more, uh, right? But they were probably his early contributions. And I remember the same time that Joe Robinson was there, I think Amartya Sen was visiting there. And I remember a conversation when the three of them were sitting uh, in the winter sun, sipping chai, I remember Amartya Sen saying that, look, we can have an, a conference on capital theory because there were the three exponents on capital theory of different types there. So his role there was quite well established. I think, I think Moshumi mentioned this. I think the most important work so far as I'm concerned was his paper on semi-feudalism. Appeared in the economic journal, it appeared slightly before he 
JNU. The paper grew out of his extensive traveling across the villages of Bengal. It led to the extensive literature on sharecropping and analyzing incentives to various types of prevalent contracts. Something that is routinely done today. You know, when we talk about incentives today, it doesn't sound very strange. But I'll tell you, I did my PhD in 1973, and someone who was my contemporary, and I will not mention the university, it's one of the prominent universities of Northern America. I asked that person about incentives, whether that was an issue. And he said, well, they had large planning models were being discussed. Students were working on it, but no one was working or looking at the question of incentives. So incentives did not appear in the 70s, except perhaps the paper by Hurwich, which appeared, which placed the topic firmly on the center stage. And that was in 1970. But yet here was Omit around the same time talking about incentives and attributing the fact that the landlords didn't have incentives to invest in their land because of the contract that was written. And the Bhaduli paper was relating the reason, okay, that consider too the fact that this was not only evidence-based research, this is something that I learned recently, that you do evidence-based research. Everyone talks about evidence-based research. Well, here was Baduli doing evidence-based research in 1970 when no one was working on that. Not only that, it was firmly grounded on his interaction with the farmers in Bengal. What could be more orthodox in today's terms? And always there were models that were simply and elegantly presented. We used to have long conversations on his travels in Bengal. I think they were really fresh in his mind. And I think you could not but be uh, affected by what he saw was the ground reality. The stark conditions under which farmers operated remain indelibly printed on my mind. I'll just give you something, a question, uh, something that I could not even imagine of. For example, in the dark, how do you cross paddy fields walking on the embankments? So in the dark, you have to cross the paddy fields. And I remember Romy telling me, did you know how you have to cross the paddy fields? I said, no. He said, you have to clap as you cross. Why in the dark? Because the places are infested with cobras. And uh, cobras move away because of the sound. So just imagine the kind of uh, framework within which the farmer has to operate. I mean, this was something which affected me tremendously. Consider, in fact, Omid Baduri's application of nonlinear dynamics and chaos theory to show the nature of complex dynamics. He was among one of the earlier exponents of this new tool. And in fact, one of the reasons why I started dabbling with these things also was because of the kind of thing that he introduced. And it was not too far away from what I used to do in any case. But then all these good things, but then Omit could 
create problems for us. I'll give you one example. You see, Omid Bhaduri was exasperated with uh, what he called neoclassical growth theory or growth theory. And you'd go around telling everyone that growth theory is horrendous, terrible, irrelevant, all kinds of things. So one of our sister centers in the SS School of Social Sciences, where two some economists were employed, got it into their heads that they want to teach an MA course in economics too, and they wanted us to join in. And so they drafted an entire curriculum. And in that, growth did not figure. So of course, naturally we picked on that. We said, what is this? Why didn't you have growth theory? They said, well, we talked with Tommy. Tommy said that growth is, you don't need to teach anything about growth. So you see, there is a problem about following Omi without understanding fully what he's been saying, right? Well, I could go on. I mean, right, I think I have more or less exceeded my limit. I've been trying to collapse six decades of interaction into a few minutes. It's not possible. Let me end with just two points. And again, one, of course, compliment Dipankar and Devarshi for doing this job. Very well done. Uh, I looked at the book and the, and the important thing that I notice is that almost every essay refers to some paper of Amit Bhaduri. So that provides a cohesion which I have seldom seen in a pastry. It is remarkably uh, well done. I think Mushumi has also talked a lot about this point. And I'd like to mention this because I think there's only one thing which I disagree with completely. And uh, I'd like to put it uh, slightly more forcefully than Moshumi. The statement that the editors have claimed is Omit is an important heterodox scholar. I wonder why, what that word heterodox is doing there. Uh, I tried to find a definition, if I could, of heterodox. I was found, the only thing I found that it's not orthodox. Well, I, I don't know what orthodox is. Perhaps orthodox today would be, unless you run RCTs, you are not orthodox. Well, then none of us are orthodox. Everyone is heterodox. And that heterodox word, I think, is, is perhaps is inappropriate so far as I'm concerned. And I think is an injustice to Omit's work. I'd strongly argue that on the basis of his body of work, Omid Bhaduri is a leading economist of the post-war generation. And I'm so glad that when I looked at the uh, blurbs, I noticed Bart, and I noticed someone else. Uh, who was the other one who has written it? I can't go back. Anyway, none of them mentioned this, that Omid is only important as an heterodox scholar. This is delimiting. He calls his own essays unconventional. I would agree with that. He calls himself a critic. Of course, he's a critic. Everyone has to be a critic. And uh, today, we have to realize he's learned nothing else 
we have to learn that we have to take our critiques into consideration. Without considering the critiques on both sides, no matter what, see the essential thing is cho choice of topics that you are working with. And in that, if someone criticizes you, fine, you'll have to look in that criticism, but you can't say that, okay, you belong to a different school, I belong to a different school. And economics has had many problems, but the worst problem is that when you start uh, dividing people up into different schools of thought. Actually, they are not. Moshumi has argued that, I mean, I have spent a bit more time, but Moshumi has already done that. She talks about convergence. I said, there's no convergence. Either do good economics or you do bad economics. I think that's the only distinction that I'd like to make. And Omid Bhaduri has done first-rate economics. And with that, I'd like to hand over to Omid for him, the critique and an ideal that we like to follow, but can't get there. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Mukherjee. Uh, I would now like to ask Professor Amit Bhaduri to share his comments. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, we can hear you. Shall I start? Yes, please. Can I start? Yes, yes. Please go ahead. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> I must say this whole business of fish drift for me has been a little bit overwhelming for me. Very sincerely, when I think of my own work, I have done it partly for pleasure, mostly for pleasure, research is for pleasure, and I have partly done it because of my political interests. But I never thought it was something which is, what I contributed is really worth celebrating. I mean it in all genuine humility. I think, you know, some of this, of course, I think has given me and I hopefully to a few others some insight. And rather than speaking at length, I will myself reveal what I consider to be the most interesting papers or interesting ideas which I worked on. I think Anjan is absolutely right. I think my you know, during my PhD and soon after that, I published papers, I became, got jobs and so on, on working for capital theory, but that was really not what led to anything. Not because it was a dead subject, but because of the fact that it did not open up anything about the real world. To me. My notion of connection between economics and real world came when I resigned from my job in the United Nations in early 1970s and came back to India without a job, deliberately without a job, because I wanted to understand Indian countryside, Indian countryside, which basically meant Indian agriculture. There were lots of political, pro, you know, fireworks going on at that time. And I came back and I traveled, as Anjan said, in quite difficult conditions. And that was when I think out of my experience, it was almost like doing experiment. It was out of my experience every day. I didn't keep systematic notes, but I kept short notes and so on. <clears throat> out of which I wrote a paper that was that paper on semi-feudalism. And then I wrote another paper, which was on usurious interest rates. Both of these papers were, you know, noted and I think lots of people wrote on them later, controversy, so on and so forth. But this is not the place to talk about the paper. This is, let me tell you just a story which actually set me on the paper. You know, I do not believe 
that in a subject like economics, you really collect a lot of data without any primitive idea of why you are collecting data, and you come to an understanding of anything deep out of this. No matter how much data you look at, and what you know, I have seen enough of people doing this, including high frequency data and so on. I think where you get your insight is actually completely from unsuspected quarters. And the semi feudalism paper, I have never told this, came from one such insight. When I was traveling in the Bengal villages in early 1970, early 1971 or late 1970, I once I fell ill. I was quite, I had very high temperature. I could not actually walk around, walk. So I could not come to the railway station or to the bus stop. So I sat down under a tree and there was nobody with me. The day before there had been a police raid in that area. So everybody was frightened and so on. So I was just sitting under a tree and trying to recover strength. And I realized I was running a fairly high temperature. It was at that time, one very kind gentleman, a villager, but he was this kind of reasonable middle peasant or somebody. He saw me, obviously from my face and my spectacles and so on. He suspected I was not a peasant. And he, he took, and he asked me and I said, you know, I'm not feeling very well. He said, you come with me. So he took me to his home. And this is the same if you listen to paper. He took me to his home and I sort of more or less passed out. Next day, I, I think I stayed there for two nights. And before I, but then I recovered. And before I came back, I, I go, you know, when I recovered and I said, thank you very much. I now want to leave. They said, no, you cannot leave. You must have a proper meal because you are a guest in the village, in the village in any village anywhere. It has happened to be in other parts in India also, in Punjab, in Maharashtra, many places, in Kerala. You cannot leave the house without having a meal. So, and they really produced a meal of fried bread, which we call luchi, and something which was a great delicacy for me at that time. So when his wife was serving the meal, I was serving the food. I noticed that she had gold bangles, a lot of gold bangles on her, on her wrist. And I had also noticed that they had a cauliflower garden, which was actually quite starved of water. The cauliflowers were drying. It was I think, the month of April or May. It was quite hot. So I casually asked him, you know, to make the conversation. I said, you know, why don't you sink a tuber for the cauliflower in your garden? So he said, do I, we can't do this because of my son, because of our brother-in-law. So I said, I did quite understand. And then he said only one sentence. He said, you see, my brother-in-law is a money lender here. So I did not connect the two. I got into the bus and I was sitting in the bus and I was looking at my notes. Nothing made the connection. And then I suddenly realized that if you, as a money lender, if you are making, getting interest and you are giving it to very poor peasants, then it must be that the peasant must remain poor so that you can get, you can regularly give money and your business can continue. And because it is a sort of joint family, because he was a money lender, this man could not make the family, you know, go wrong, create family problem by breaking his business and trying to make some of the peasants better off because then his interest in common good. This was the beginning of my understanding of semi feudalism that if you have two modes of making income, two modes of exploiting or two modes of making income, then they can come into conflict of what Anjan said, that the incentive structure becomes quite different from what you read in textbooks and profit motive, single you know, incentive and so on. 
This was a semi-feudalist paper. And similarly, there was another paper, which I remembered another conversation, which Anjan would remember. This was with, who recently died with Aruk Malik. We are both traveling to Calcutta University. I had gone for some reason. And we were both traveling in a bus. We are, did not have a seat and we are both standing. So I told, you know, I have, I have now discovered why banks do not lend money to small peasants because, you know, for various reasons, but local money lenders are quite willing to lend them money and make so much money out. So is it really how? So I said, you know, it is the story of Dostoevsky's Raskolnikov. You know, Raskolnikov was the man who killed the old woman who gave the. So I said, Dostoevsky. So Oru, who I think gets the argument, this was my paper on, you know, usurious interest on which many others worked in Koshik and so on. The Oru immediately said, Omidda, if you have got Dostoevsky mathematized, then it must be right. And this was what of Mulli. <laughs> and that was my other paper, which I think was actually came completely out of experience. None of these papers had any reference to anybody. They did not come from reading literature. They did not come from systematic, you know, shifting through data, but they came from enormous impression which I collected over a one and a half year. It was, you can call it anthropological, you can call it sociological, you can call it like an observing scientist who observes nature and comes up with this. There are famous examples in biology of that. You know, there is the example of the first Nobel Prize winner in economics, Steinbergen, whose brother, in case you do not know, Steinbergen's younger brother left school. He did not finish his high school because he was too interested in observing nature. And he finally got it in also a Nobel Prize in biology for noticing the hard behavior of a certain kind of fish. Now you see observing, like for scientists observing nature, for economists observing the society, I think is of fundamental importance. If you don't do it, I mean, this I mean all sincerity, and if there is anything of value, if really there is anything of value in my uh, writings and so on, it is because of this, my observing society and being involved with the society. I see in the uh, face shift, I have been you know, defined by many as somebody who combines activism with research and my research grows out of my activism and so on. But what they call activism is actually not a conscious, deliberate, scientific interest to write papers for which I do activism. But the two sort of somehow automatically merge in my personality. I do certain things like, you know, I went when Arundhati Roy and all these people were also doing. We all observed how land was being taken away. And I wrote a paper on that quite recently in land acquisition, what it means, what it, you know, etc. Now, this is where I think really economics lies. The other thing which I, I think I did and for which I think in, the, in America and in Europe, my work is much better known, is macroeconomics. Now, there, I think there is one thing which I learned, which I had not learned before. That is, you see, and this is something which Schumpeter had said about Marx. Schumpeter, who did not like Marx, but admired him. Schumpeter had said about Marx, that, you see, if you are really a good economist, scientist, whatever it is, if you are really good at something, and if you have really found something in theory, then it must be that it is not particularly biased to one, one way of looking at the problem. Now, I, this is something when Steve Margolin, who was then at Harvard and had come from Harvard and I had gone from Calcutta, when we were working together, I realized that, and this was one of the constant 
with quite a frequent conversation between Steve and me, that you see, if Keynes' theory is really good, in which we both believe, then Keynes' theory must be something which can accommodate many different trends of doing this. And this is how our profit-led, wage-led paper to which, you know, Robert started with, our paper started with, that the Keynesianism is something which is a much broader in its scope than what you make out to be as one simple version of Keynesianism. Now, this particular thing apart, I think there is not much else in my work which will I mean, you know, papers, you write papers, you publish papers in international journals, and this is a kind of thing which we do as a part of our profession. But if anything which stays a little bit beyond of lasting value, this is simply this notion that economists must learn to observe society. And learning to observe society is not for just to, you know, just to make right papers, but, but if you are, I'll be told to shift on this. On the other hand, you see, if you learn to observe society, you automatically involve in it. You see, it is, it is quite different from science. It is quite different from physical sciences, where you can be a physicist, you can look at the experiment and you can stay out of it, or a biologist and you can stay out of it, and you can observe it from a distance. In the problem with economics is you observe society, and as you observe society, you cannot remain neutral. You, and this is what they call me an activist economist, that's how they have described here. This is where the act, my root of activism and my root of economics also. Thank you. I think I have finished. Thank you very much, Professor Vaduri. So we, we have some time. Uh, I would like to uh, invite anybody who wants to speak. Uh, just put your name in the chat box and I will maintain a list and we will go down it. Right now, there is nobody on the list. So if every, anybody wants to go, uh, just uh, let me know through the chat box. The, the reason for going through the chat box is I cannot see everybody in one pane. So if you raise your hand, I will not be able to call you and write you. So the best way is to go through the chat box. Anybody wants to make any comments? Maybe, uh, okay, uh, we see somebody. Sunil Asha, please go ahead. And then Maria Floro. Uh, uh, am I audible? Yes, and I would ask you to please keep your comment short between a minute or so. Actually, uh, I just wanted to uh, kind of uh, congratulate you on such a uh, great uh, book and uh, work of uh, uh, Professor Amit Bhaduri, whom I worked with my PhD at JNU. And I understood a lot of uh, interesting macroeconomics as uh, I was uh, a classmate of Moshimi, who was uh, just now spoke. And uh, I had, uh, we had re I really understood macroeconomics for the first time, I would say, despite being from Delhi School of Economics, where I don't know what I understood because I could not really feel that it stayed with me at all. So after finishing my MPhil, I realized that I really don't uh, want to kind of do any more of this stuff. So then I, at that time, Professor Amit Padhuri had just come back and then we all PhD students were sitting last benching in his class. And there basically, uh, I was working also at NIPFP at the same time with one um, uh, uh, Professor uh, Parthasati Shom and uh, Sheetal Chan from IMF who were teaching us, uh, who were, I mean, working on the financial programming model, which is basically based on quantity of money. And then I couldn't really figure out what they are doing. 
but then uh, in the process i kind of uh, collected some data and did some inflation analysis and all and then uh, in one of the classes professor amit bhavi actually was teaching that financial programming model and i really kind of uh, suddenly uh, you can say the i really understood things so well that i was so amazed and then i realized that uh, i i wish i could get him as my phd supervisor and then i worked very hard to show that uh, inflation and how does it not really get affected by money supply but also agricultural uh, output dynamics and buffer stocks and all play a very important role and that basically made me going and i kind of uh, uh, later on got to work with him and then understood so much of the macroeconomics which now i teach as my as a teacher of macroeconomics in a management school and i give them a very different perspective than the standard thing they are taught and i feel kind of a really great uh, that's the small comment i'll just make thank you very much sunil uh, next we have maria floro yes uh thank you uh, uh Deep, uh dipana for um, giving me the time to share my uh, you know my admiration uh, to amit uh, amit i don't know whether you remember me i was a student of don harris as well at stanford together with sergi yeah yeah yes sergi floro yes i want to mention that i yeah. have admired you um, from afar i know that you've been traveling all over the world but what i really admire is how you see scholarship and research for a greater objective not only did you observe society which i followed in my field work in the philippines collecting data about money lenders as well you were the source of that you know uh, in inspired me for working on that but you write about your observation and use that for the greater good which is to help transform society so you link your political activism with the work and research that you you have been doing all these years and i want to say that i benefited a lot from your uh, unwavering support and encouragement during also the difficult time when i collected field work in the philippines on informal credit and trying to bring out the underlying social relations and power relations one last thing i want to mention too is the mit is a great supporter of uh, uh, of gender analysis in economics and and my being a feminist economist is also partly to do with amit baduri's support for the gender working group on um if you remember nilfer chatai and others who put together this uh you know i would say um pivotal and seminal uh uh group of gender um economists uh, and macroeconomists so i just want to thank you for all that uh um you know inspiration and and guidance that you have given me and other gender and feminist economists thank you thank you maria next we have arun kumar uh so you know i was professor bhadri's uh, phd student way back in uh, 77 i had come back from princeton university where i was doing phd in physics and i'd quit physics and wanted to do economics uh so i learned a hell of a lot from him his uh, paper you know this uh, semi feudalism paper was very influential but he also encouraged me to do a lot of other work you know apart from doing the uh, phd in uh, terms of trade and uh, incomes you know that that was my topic uh so i went you know he uh, he was collaborating with uh, you know janaki uh, 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 mrs J uh, you know uh, devki jain sorry you know and uh, i went to textile labor association in ahmedabad to study you know the agricultural labor there and uh, i also you know was working on sugar industry uh, so i realized you know what the role of trade and government is in agricultural markets as a result of that and that also pushed me into working towards the black economy Uh, which i have been researching since 1979 80 and that was entirely empirical because you know hardly any work was going on on this issue of black economy uh, but i learned a lot of uh, macro history box diagrams and you know uh, other such things which then helped me you know uh, to do my research on the black economy which i have been researching since then and that also led me to go into you know uh, the public finance area and i managed to do a lot of macro public finance also because of uh, 
what I learned from him and then, you know, by observing what he was doing. So it's been entirely observational, you know, my research. Uh, so I really need to thank him uh, how much influence he's had on my research and on my work. So thanks, Professor Bhadri, for being there and, you know, uh, look forward to more of your writings. Thanks. Thank you very much. Next, we have Santosh Kumar, an activist from Delhi. Hi, uh, Professor. Uh, I have a question for um, uh, Professor Amit Bhadri. Uh, sir, I just want to a brief comment on uh, contextualizing the current farms agitation, present movement in Delhi in terms of uh, agrarian, political economy of agrarian change, because this is not the demand for the land. So how you are seeing this protest? Thank you. Well, so far as the farmers movement is concerned, I have written several pieces on it in newspapers, and they have all been published in several Indian languages. And I fully support it. I support it for one simple reason. We cannot discuss it in detail. You see, if you, they, today they say that, the, you know, the farmers are exploited by traders. traders, because the traders, you know, really earn money from the farmers and particularly in Punjab and so on. But the farmers are in favor of it because they at least have an assured market. Now, you see, what the government wants to do is to take the market out of the smaller traders and give it to two or three big traders. Certainly Adani, who already has silos, Ambani's, who have vested interest, two of the richest businessmen in India. Now, this is really corporatization of agriculture. So, I, I think this has been a disaster. This will be a disaster in India for various reasons, which I cannot get into. And it's not ideological. We can discuss it. The second thing, which is very important and which is not mentioned, is they want to take away the civil rights. They're not civil rights. civil rights. They want to take away the rights of the farmers to complain legally. Because you see, what the bill consists of is that the government should, government passes a law and the government is the one which will decide whether the farmers are right or wrong. So the execution becomes the judge. Now, no, no democracy can accept it. So this is a total, this is a bill which must go. I think the farmers are absolutely right. It must be repealed. But here we cannot go more into it. If you want to read, you can write me an email. I will send you some of the articles. I have been writing on it for a long time on this. Thank you. So we have next Gogol. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Nipongarda. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to express my gratitude to Professor Vaduri. His writings have been enormously influential for me uh, in shaping uh, both my thinking about economics and the society, particularly uh, on my research, particularly his three papers, the Vaduri Margarin paper, the endogenous growth paper, which was published in CG in 2006 or seven, and the Dynamics of profit-led and wage-led growth. I think those two papers came one after another. And another, another of his writing, which not only me but many of us who studied from the ANU, even though Professor Bhadwe did not teach us, uh, was his book, the Macroeconomics of uh, the Dynamics of Commodity Production. For most of us who who, who have come from JNU, it's it's, it's, that's, that's the book. I, I remember Professor Patnayak taught us that course. And other than his lecture notes, what we studied were, were Professor Bahadur's book and a few essays of Keleski. And that is what is the interest that we have, uh, so many of us have in macroeconomics somewhere, I think. Um, yeah, those macro classes and his book 
has sustained them. I think even some of us have gone off and studied other schools, mainstream, neoclassical. But you know, it's because of I I believe it's because of the interest that uh, Professor Haduri's writing has generated, kind of inspired some of us to go and read others also. Thanks. Thank you, Dipankar and Devoshita for organizing this. Thank you, Gogol. So we are uh, reaching eleven. So I think uh, there are no more people on the stack. Okay, I see. Uh, yeah, there are no more no more people on the on the list. So I, I can make a comment. Like to now. Sorry, did somebody want to say something? Yeah, I just you know I have been in touch with Dr. Amit Bhadri. I'm one of the few lakh fans that uh, legendary Amit Bhadri has, and I'm this is Banikant Mishra. I do research in, I, I teach finance, do research in economics finance. So I talked to him, but since in public, I would like him to share, is social science under a threat now in many parts of the world? And particularly the part, you know, particularly economics and the part which is non-mainstream economics is under threat, more so because it is exposing the vested interest like the ones. It is, what can you do to ensure that both the non-mainstream economics and social sciences don't vanish. So, Professor Bhaduri. Professor Bhaduri, would you like to respond? Well, most of them have said how much they found my work interesting, influential, etc. What can I say? Really nothing. But I would like to just mention two things, which one is you know, Robert, I'm talking to Robert Blaker. I think one of the things which I wanted to say, the open economy profit led wage led thing, I read one of your latest papers, I can't remember which one, where I think you have got what is needed to start on linking it with big scale you know, industry, the corporations and so on. That is, when wage is raised, you know, it does not necessarily lead to wage-led growth because it depends on how the profit margin gets affected. That is basically your argument because how much the profit margin gets affected. This is something which I have long thought to be the case. That whether, you know, they can just pass on the wage increase to the consumers or whether they have to bear it part of it themselves. And in extreme cases, it can become actually, if they take most of it, then it stays wage led growth. The limits to wage led growth under corporatism is something which I think is really worth writing simply about. Because, you know, this is something which I don't think people have fully understood. And I think you are one of the few people whose latest work I've seen this being done. Long time ago, I did try to do something in a paper in, I think in Vienna, in honor of, I forget now, somebody, maybe Steindl, where I had tried to make this, but I think it comes out much more clearly in your paper. This is one thing I wanted to tell you because you mentioned the last paper of mine and I mentioned this because it is one of your latest papers, which is not published. That I will now hand it over to Debarshi Das for the note of thanks. Yeah, I hope I'm audible. Uh, so uh, I thank all of you for joining us uh, at this uh, not very usual time, at least for India. Uh, so uh, starting off, we had this uh, face script conference in UMass uh, Amherst in 2019. So the funders were uh, University of Massachusetts Amherst. So we thank them for funding the Facescript uh, conference. Participants at the conference, uh, many of them actually uh, came thousands of kilometers. And this was the time when, you know, the air traffic schedule was uh, thrown haywire because there was a war-like situation between Pakistan and India. So it was not easy traveling to US during that time. Uh, 
yet people came um contributors to the fest trip uh, we thank them all they have kept to the deadline they have been very patient with us the editors uh, the publication house tailors and francis especially we would like to thank uh, rimina shoma and dharmendra the people who have guided us through the process uh, we thank uh, priyanka shivastav uh, for letting us use uh, the picture so i should uh, show you at least the book because we are releasing a book uh, so this is the book the south asian edi edition is this one and the picture that you see on the cover is by priyanka so she has uh, been generous to allow us to use this picture uh, and this is the this is the international edition uh, so these two books have come out simultaneously i hope the indian edition will come out in the market very soon uh we also thank obviously the panelists who have attended today and made it a very lively discussion professor blaker professor das professor mukherjee and of course professor vaduri we should thank him uh, for being our teacher and for being an inspiration beyond the classroom also many people have mentioned this uh, and i could not articulate myself better than the others and finally i thank you all for giving us your time and being here thank you thank you thank all. you very much and hope to see many of you and be in touch and i hope you have a chance to uh, read the book thank you i will end the session now thank you thank you thank you thank you very much for having the session thank you thank you, thank you very much